this presentation, we will focus on the Book of Mosiah, chapters 1 through 3. We'll take a look at the teachings and the settings and different things that we can learn from Mosiah chapters 1 through 3. So let's start with a Mosiah introduction. With the book of Mosiah, we are introduced to Mormon's abridgment of the large plates of Nephi. In comparison with the small plates, this part of the record contains a disproportionate amount of history, given that it covers in 29 chapters a span of time less than four decades. Nevertheless, the book of Mosiah is a veritable mint of doctrinal truths. Having been instructed by an angel of God, King Benjamin teaches of the necessity for putting off the natural man, of being born again as to the things of righteousness, of becoming sons and daughters of Christ, and of retaining a remission of sins through selfless service. His invitation to the faithful to renew and honor their covenants, as well as his charge for members of the church to truly take upon them the name of Christ, are doctrines central to the message of the Book of Mormon. As the message of Benjamin was to the faithful and obedient in the shadows of the temple, so the testimony of Abinadi was to the faithless and the disobedient in the darkness of Noah's court. As Benjamin spoke of deliverance and liberation from sin through the coming Messiah, so Abinadi warned of destruction and bondage through continued allegiance to the prince of darkness. With a plain Thus unmatched in the biblical record, Abinadi explains the reality behind the imagery of the law of Moses and attests that salvation does not come by the law of loan, but in and through the atoning blood of Christ. With the words of Isaiah as a text, Abinadi explains the doctrine of the condescension of God, the coming to earth of the great Jehovah, and thus the manner in which Jesus Christ will minister as both Father and Son. Though Abinadi died a martyr's death, he unknowingly passed the torch of truth to Alma, a young man among the priests of Noah. Having taken upon himself the name of Christ, Alma personified the principles he taught his own people. He stood as a valiant witness of God at all times, in all things, and in all places. Following the union of Alma's community of believers with the people of King Mosiah, Alma was called to preside over the Church of Christ in the land of Zarahemla. The concluding chapters of the Book of Mosiah chronicle difficulties within the church, not the least of which was the opposition from Alma, the son of Alma, and the sons of King Mosiah. At the prayerful bidding of the righteous, the heavens were rent, and an angel of the Lord was sent to reprimand them and to direct, redirect the course of misdirected youth. As Paul was to the Gentiles, so Alma and the sons of Mosiah came to be to the Nephites and the Lamanites. Few persons in earth's history would labor with the missionary zeal and the prophetic power of these sons of the covenant who had been snatched from the very jaws of hell. In them, we have a dramatic demonstration of the nature of true conversion the power of Christ to change men's souls. So with that, let's begin. Mosiah chapter 1. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Righteousness and ignorance are incompatible. The glory of God is and ever has been intelligence, meaning light and truth. Parents in all gospel dispensations have been charged with the responsibility to teach their children the principles of righteousness to the extent that those principles have been revealed to them. Each generation is charged with the responsibility of passing to the exceeding generation the torch of light and truth by which they have been guided. To fail to do so is to come under the condemnation of God. To this end, Alma kept a book of remembrance, and he and Eve taught their children to read and write. Of that dispensation, we are told that it was given unto as many as called upon God to write by the spirit of inspiration, and that they in turn taught the same to their children. The best of memory is no match for the written word. Scripture is the memory of a nation. It is a perpetual flame, a constant source of light and warmth. King Benjamin suggests that even their faithful fathers, the likes of Lehi, Nephi, and Jacob, would have dwindled in unbelief had they not had scriptural records to keep the commandments of God constantly before their eyes. 
One experienced gospel teacher has observed that he had never seen anyone who was consistent in scripture study and at the same time remiss in keeping the covenants he had made with God. Literacy is the hem, helm of the ship of civilization, scripture the rudder. Those to whom God speaks most often are those who are most attentive to that which he has already spoken. Scripture is the seabed of continual revelation. Joseph Smith, for instance, received more revelation while he was studying the revelations than while engaged in other activities. Every member of the church ought to be literate. Ignorance brings no honor to God. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. Shift from first-person accounts to third-person in the book of Mosiah. There is a shift from the first-person account of the early books in the Book of Mormon to the third-person account in the Book of Mosiah. The book of 1st Nephi through Omni were translated from the small plates of Nephi and are the works of the original writers. Consequently, they were written in the first person. The books of Mosiah through 4th Nephi, however, all come from Mormon's abridgment of the large plates of Nephi. These books are Mormon's abridgment of the original author's records. Chapter 1, verses 2 and 4, the phrase, the language of his fathers, language of the Egyptians, meant, the Nephites described the written language as Reformed Egyptian, indicating that they have freely altered the Egyptian to suit their own purposes. It is difficult to know exactly what is meant when King Benjamin indicates that the brass plates were written in Egyptian. Perhaps the phrase language of the Egyptians in this verse means the same thing that Nephi meant when he spoke of the language of his father, and thus the language of the Book of Mormon, as consisting of the learning of the Jews and the language of the Egyptians. That is to say, the Nephite record reflected the Hebrew culture and background of the Jews, but was written in Egyptian characters. In the present context, then, the brass plates may have been records of Hebrew prophets and their prophecies, all recorded in an Egyptian script. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Taught, the phrase taught in all the language of the fathers, meant... King Benjamin taught his sons the Egyptian language, see verse 4, so that they could read the scriptures. He lists six blessings his son would obtain because of this. One, verse 2, that they might become men of understanding, which is coming to know things in your heart, not by the intellect. Two, in verse 2, that they might know the prophecies of the fathers that came from the Lord. Three, found in verse 3, so that they would not suffer in ignorance. As to the importance of a knowledge of the gospel, the prophet Joseph Smith said that it is impossible for a man to be saved in ignorance, that he had in mind that he had in mind ignorance of gospel truths is evident from the fact that on another occasion he said, quote, a man is saved no faster than he gets knowledge, for if he does not get knowledge, he will not be brought into captivity by some evil power in the other world, as evil spirits will have more knowledge and consequently more power than many men who are on the earth. Hence, it needs revelation to assist us and give us knowledge of the things of God. End of his quote. Number four, verse three. Without the knowledge of the scriptures, they would not know the mysteries of God. A mystery is a truth that cannot be known except through divine revelation. A sacred secret. In our day, such truths as those pertaining to the restoration of the priesthood, the work for the dead, and the reestablishment of the church are mysteries, because they could not have been discovered except by revelation. Number five, in verse four, so that they could teach their children, so that they could teach them, so that they could teach them to their ch to their children, fulfilling the commandments of God. Parents are responsible to teach their children the commandments of God. Though they can be greatly assisted by the church and its auxiliaries, the responsibility to see that children have been properly taught remains with the parents. 
Though mothers may assume the great teaching role, particularly with younger children, the divine obligation to see that children are properly taught rests first with the father. This is simply a manifestation of the patriarchal order. Neither the church nor its auxiliaries is eternal, whereas the family unit, including the patriarchal order, will continue among the righteous in the world to come. The government of heaven is family government, and salvation is a family affair. If you are relying just on the teachings that your children get once a week in the church, they will be lacking considerably in the knowledge to be saved. The gospel must be taught in the home and led by the father and accompanied by the mother. Number six in verse five, so that they could always have God's commandments before their eyes, so that they would not become like the Lamanites and dwindle in unbelief. The Mulekite civilization Civilization is a classic illustration of a nation without the anchor of scriptural writ going adrift in a troubled sea. Chapter 1, verse 6, the phrase, I would that you should remember these sayings are true, meaning King Benjamin testifies that the scriptural record had by the Nephites are true. In so doing, he is not merely saying that they are factually correct, but rather that they contain a trustworthy and faithful account of God's dealings with the children of men, of the covenants he had made with those of the house of Israel, and of the principles by which salvation comes. Chapter 1, verse 7, the phrase, search them diligently, means... Although the principle of salvation are plainly taught, and though no principle of salvation will be cloaked in obscurity or ambiguity, the word of God is man's greatest treasure, and one must search diligently to obtain it. Diligently means consistently. We must be consistent in our scripture study, not we do it for a couple of days for an hour and then we go a couple of weeks without. No, we must be consistent. Joseph Smith has heard that, quote, the things of God are of deep import, and time and experience and careful and ponderous and solemn thoughts can only find them out, end of quote. Diligently means to be consistent. Our scripture study should be consistent, not just a little here and a little there. The phrase in verse 7, keep the commandments, means... A knowledge of the things of God is inseparably connected with obedience to the commandments of God. If any man will do his, God's will, he shall know of the doctrine, Christ testified. John added, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. In like manner, modern revelation attests that the knowledge and intelligence are the offspring of diligence and obedience. Prophets of all ages have taught that God cannot be known, nor that his gospel be understood by the carnal mind, the disobedient, or the rebellious. Chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. Three years prior to his death, Father Adam called the righteous residue of his posterity into grand council, where he bestowed upon them his last blessings. Before his death, Israel gathered his sons and the families together, that he might tell them that which would befall them in the last days. Joseph did likewise with his posterity, as did Moses with the nation of Israel. Benjamin, King Benjamin, following the example of his prophetic predecessors, sought to announce Mosiah as his successor, to admonish his people, and to leave a final blessing with them. In the invitation for his people to assemble, Benjamin said, I shall give this people a name, that thereby they may be distinguished above all people, which the Lord God hath brought out of the land of Jerusalem. And this I do, because they have been a diligent people in keeping the commandments of the Lord, meaning they had been consistent. What follows to the end of chapter 5 is one of the most detailed recitations of a discourse contained in Holy Writ. It is not until the conclusion of this discourse that Benjamin announces the name to be given his people. Benjamin grew, knew of no greater honor that could be conferred upon his people than that they bear the name of their master and savior, 
the Christ, and that they, through the adoption of righteousness, become his sons and daughters. Such was the setting in which Mosiah was consecrated and anointed as their king in the stead of his father. How like that great and grand council of heaven this must have been, where the eternal father chose his most righteous son to be our king, and where he placed ourselves under covenant to sustain him as such. Chapter 1, verse 10, the phrase, a king and a ruler over this people, means. It is interesting that the text designates Mosiah as a king and a a ruler rather than king and ruler or the king and the ruler. The other two references to this ordination also refer to him as a king and a ruler. In sacred covenant, Benjamin's people will take upon themselves the name of Christ. Christ is the king and the ruler of his people. Mosiah, covenant servant of Christ, is more popularly to be thought of as a king and a ruler. Mosiah was not willing to overstep his bound and to call himself the king and the ruler. That designation only applies to Jesus Christ. A close examination of the Book of Mormon reveals numerous traditions and customs that have their origin in ancient Israel. There is a striking similarity similarity between Mosiah's ascendancy to the Nephite throne in the first chapters of Mosiah and how kings were crowned in the Old Testament. Some notable similarities between the Book of Mormon and Old Testament coronation ceremonies include 1. A belief that the kings were chosen by heaven. 2. The sanctuary as the place of the coronation, meaning the temple. Three, bestowal of sacred relics, artifacts, or other objects at the same time of coronation. And four, the anointing of the king. In addition, the ideal was that the new king take office before the death of the old one. This transfer of power was connected with the ceremony where the people make or renew their covenant with God. This took place a little later after King Benjamin's people when they proclaimed, we are willing to enter into a covenant with our God to do his will and to be obedient to his commandments. Mosea 5.5 5. Chapter 1, verse 11, the phrase, a name whereby they may be distinguished above all people, meaning the name King Benjamin will give his people is Christ. Christ is the sacred title, which means anointed or anointed one. As with virtually all titles, one does not have the right to assume it. Rather, it must be conferred. Those assuming the title by an anointing of their own are impostors and will be held strictly to account in the day of judgment. Those of whom the title is properly conferred are rightful heirs of the powers and privileges associated with the name. We are reminded of the Jewish exorcist who sought to cast out a devil in the name of Jesus, of whom Paul preached. The evil spirit answered, saying, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. As those who falsely assume the name of Christ are without power, so those who had it properly bestowed upon them and magnify their calling may have power to do all that he did and greater works. We get the name of Christ conferred upon us as we are baptized and confirmed members of the church and given the gift of the Holy Ghost. We cannot assume that power on our own. Chapter 1, verse 11, the phrase, people which the Lord God had brought up out of the land of Jerusalem, means, it is difficult to suppose that King Benjamin had in mind all other possible migrations from the land of Jerusalem. Rather, he sought to distinguish his people, who will again take upon them, themselves the name of Christ, from those rejecting the everlasting covenant and mediator of the covenant, Christ the Lord. Chapter 1, verse 12, the phrase, except it be through transgression. Virtually all God's promises and blessings are granted to men or nations in our mortal estate, are conditional. 
even when conditions are not specifically stated, the very system of salvation implies that there are no unearned blessings. When righteousness ceases, the promise of blessing cease, ceases also. In the true sense of the word, there are no covenant people unless a covenant has been made and the conditions of the covenant are honored. There are no covenants with the Lord that do not require obedience and righteousness. All ordinances of salvation have efficacy, virtue, and force only in and through the name of Christ. In these ordinances, which come by covenant, we take upon ourselves his name. Through them, we obtain joint heirship with him, of whom the whole family of heaven and earth is named. No power in heaven or earth, save wickedness only, can sever these familial ties, bringing the forfeiture of the promised inheritance. Thus, in this sacred and solemn assembly, the citizens of Zarahemla sustained their earthly king, doing so in token of their renewed covenant to sustain their heavenly master, whose name they bear through the continued righteousness. The only blessing I know that is unconditional is the resurrection. That will come upon men, wicked or righteous, no matter what. But if you're resurrected as the wicked, what good is that once you stand before the Maker and are judged? All other blessings are based upon the conditions of covenants and ordinances of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Chapter 1, verse 13, like the ancient Canaanites who had rejected every word of old, I'm sorry, that should be old, and became ripe in iniquity, thus incurring the wrath of God upon them, so too would the Nephites incur God's wrath that they should fall into transgression, having been a highly fevered people of the Lord. They would be delivered up to and become weak like unto the Lamanites. Chapter 1, verses 15 through 16. Mosiah's charge was for things both temporal and spiritual. He was to care for their scripture records and their sacred relics, the sword of Laban and the Liahona. The phrase the baller director meant, our fathers called it the baller director, the baller director, Liahona, which is being interpreted a compass. As to the manner of its operation, we read in Alma 37, 38 through 45, quote, And now, my son, I have somewhat to say concerning the things which our father called a ball or director, or our fathers called it Leahona, which being interpreted a compass. And the Lord prepared it, and behold, there cannot any man work after the manner of so curious a workmanship. And behold, it was prepared to show unto our fathers the course which they should travel in the wilderness. And it did work for them according to their faith in God. Therefore, if they had faith to believe that God should cause that those spindles should point the way they should go, behold, it was done. Therefore, they had this miracle, and also many other miracles wrought by the power of God day by day. Nevertheless, because those miracles were worked by small means, it did show unto them marvelous works. They were slothful and forgot to exercise their faith in diligence, and then those marvelous works ceased, and they did not progress in their journey. Therefore they tarried in the wilderness, or did not travel a direct course, and were afflicted with hunger and thirst because of their transgressions. And now, my son, I would that you should understand that these things are not without a shadow. For as our fathers were slothful to give heed to this compass, now these things were temporal, they did not prosper. Even so it is with things which are spiritual. For behold, it is as easy to give heed to the word of Christ, which will point you a straight course to eternal bliss, as it was for our fathers to give heed to this compass, which would point unto them a straight course to the promised land. And now I say, is there not a type in this thing? For just as surely as this director did bring our fathers to follow its course to the promised land, shall the words of Christ, if we follow their course, carry us beyond this dell of sorrow into a far better land of promise. End of Alma's quote. Brothers and sisters, we all have a Leahona that is easy to follow. They're called the words of Christ. We only have to open them and search them and ponder them. And just like the spindles on the Leahona, they will point us to God. That's why Satan tempts you not to study the scriptures daily.
because he knows they will point you to Christ. Chapter 1, verse 17, the phrase smitten with famine and sore afflictions. Because of our fallen nature, we tend to follow after the enticings of the natural man, which are carnal, sensual, and devilish. Thus the Lord, in his infinite wisdom, brings upon mankind from time to time famines, afflictions, etc., to help humble our hearts and put off the natural man and look unto Christ for guidance, direction, and salvation. This is why we go through trials and afflictions, brothers and sisters, when you and I are faced with afflictions, trials, or infirmities that are not caused by sin, but just come to us because of our fallen nature and in a fallen world. We have two choices. We can either get mad at God because he won't take them away and he won't take the pain away, or we can use them and turn our hearts to God to ask him to help us through them. And then our faith grows and we become unshakable. Chapter 1, verse 18, the temple. As in the old world, so in the new world, the temple was the focal point of worship among the Lord's people. It was the natural and accepted place to which they gathered to be instructed by their spiritual leader. It was the at the temple site and bountiful that Christ manifested himself and taught the Nephites following his resurrection in Jerusalem. The pattern of the Nephite temples, at least until after the time of Christ's visit, was that of Solomon's temple, the outer court being a place of instruction. Let's now turn to Mosiah chapter 2. Chapter 2 verse 1, the phrase, go up to the temple. One always went up to the temple, it being the mount of the Lord's house, the place of ritual descent to the divine presence, the place of heavenly instruction. So when scriptures, especially in the book of Mormon, they say we went up to the temple, don't always think that they're going now north. The temple could be south, which we usually think of down, but you always say we're going up to the temple because we're going up to the heavenly mount of the Lord's house. It takes us up to him. Chapter 2, verse 3, the phrase that they might offer sacrifice meant, apparently the burnt offering was the ordinance practiced from the time of Adam. This same offering will be offered again in our dispensation, by the sons of Lephi in the fulfillment of the prophecies of Malachi and John the Baptist and the promise of Joseph Smith. Won't that be interesting? That still has not been restored. The offering of burnt offerings of a lamb. The fact that they offered sacrifice and burnt offerings according to the law of Moses does not necessarily imply the existence of the intricate system of sacrifice in the law of carnal commandments. Chapter 2, verse 5, according to his family, meaning Mormon's account alludes to a type of patriarchal organization among the people of Zarahemla. Chapter 2, verse 6, pitch their tents towards the temple, phrase meant pitching their, ten, their tents towards the temple and King Benjamin would be symbolic of their desire to face the Lord and his anointed leader. This is quite a contrast when compared to Lot in the Old Testament, who pitched his tent towards Sodom. See, his back would have been towards Jehovah. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the city of the plain and pitched his tent towards Sodom, Genesis 13, 12 states. Thus, we have two choices in mortality, that of choosing to face the world and having our backs turned towards the Lord, as represented by the leading brethren of the church, or we can face the Lord by facing the brethren and turn our backs to the world. We can choose. Elder Lynn G. Robbins of the Presidency of the Seventy related, quote, Which way do we face? President Boyd K. Packer surprised me with this puzzling question while we were traveling together on my very first assignment as a new Seventy. Without an explanation to put the question in context, I was baffled. A 70, he continued, does not represent the people to the prophet, but the prophet to the people. Never forget which way you face. It was a powerful lesson. Trying to please others before pleasing God is inverting the first and second great commandments. It is forgetting which way we face. And yet we all, 
We have all made that mistake because of the fear of men. In Isaiah, the Lord warns us, Fear ye not the reproach of men. In Lehi's dream, this fear was triggered by the finger of scorn pointed from the great spacious building, causing many to forget which way they faced and to leave the tree ashamed. End of quote. Brothers and sisters, which way do we face? Whom do we face? Do we have the courage to face the brethren in all things and have our backs to the world? Chapter 2, verse 9, the phrase, and your hearts, and your hearts that ye may understand, means not only were the people to open their eyes, their ears, I'm sorry, that they may hear the words of King Benjamin by the power of the Spirit, they were to also open their hearts so that they would understand. Notice that understanding came from the heart and not the mind. In Scripture, the heart is where conversion takes place. Thus, King Benjamin wanted the people not just to hear his word, but let them sink deep into their souls, their hearts, so that enabled them to come and stay on the covenant path and implement the righteous application of truth in their lives. As Mosiah 26, 3 points out, and now because of their unbelief, they could not understand the word of God and their hearts were hardened. The heart is where we get the word of God, conversion. Chapter 2, verse 9, the phrase, Mysteries of God unfolded, meant to the uninformed Latter-day Saint, nothing in King Benjamin's discourse would be considered a mystery. Yet to the world, to those untutored in the foundational truths of salvation, the things of which he speaks remain a mystery. Chapter 2, verse 11, the phrase, I am subject to all manners infirmities, means prophets like all men are subject to the frailties of the flesh. Righteousness does not excuse one from the infirmities of mortality. Suffering and pain, self-doubt, and intense feelings of inadequacy are well known to those called to serve of God, to the service of God. Indeed, none suffered the during the sting of mortality more intently than God's own Son, Jesus the Christ. The phrase chosen by this people meant that King Benjamin ruled through the consent of the governed. His authority was that of virtue, not of the sword. And then the word consecrated means anointed and set apart to his office. Benjamin's service was consecrated, made sacred in the service of God and his people. He lived the law of consecration having rendered all that he had by way of time, talent, and means to the service of others. In the temple, we consecrate all of our time, talents, and means to God's kingdom and the building up of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and to the establishment of Zion. Chapter 2, verse 16, the phrase, I have only been in the service of God, meant, we serve God by serving each other. Of acts of goodness and kindness, the Savior said, Inasmuch as ye have done it the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Conversely, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. That is also true. To stain our clothes and soil our hands in the service of others is but to cleanse our own souls. We are sanctified through properly serving others. The world would be a poor place indeed had Christ and his prophets sought to sequester themselves in secluded monasteries rather than lose themselves in the service of their fellow men. Chapter 2, verse 17, the phrase, learn wisdom meant. The psalmist who told us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom also told us that the knowledge of God is reserved for those who do his commandments. Wisdom, which is the coinage of heaven, is acquired by him who labors in heaven's cause. The same lays up in store that he perishes not, but bears salvation to his soul. It is synonymous with intelligence, which Doctrine Covenants 9336 tells us that intelligence is the glory of God, or in other words, light and truth, which means the ability to perceive truth and act upon it. Thus, to learn wisdom is to learn righteous application of truth 
in our lives. As we righteously apply the truths of the gospel, then we are becoming intelligent and wise. Chapter 2, verse 17, the phrase, When you are in the service of your fellow beings, you are only in the service of your God. Elder Hartman Rector Jr. of the 70s states, Then to walk guiltless before God, we must love and serve others. His statement through Ken Benjamin that when you are in the service of fellow beings, you are only in the service of your God, I believe, can popularly be turned around to say that. Unless you are in the service of your bill of beings, ye are not in the service of your God. Mormon expressed this thought, which was recorded by his son Moroni, when he said, quote, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, if ye have not charity, ye are nothing, for charity never faileth. And whoso is found possessed of it at the last day, it shall be well with him. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, pray unto the Father with all the energy of your heart, that ye may be filled with this love, which he hath bestowed upon all who are true followers of Jesus Christ, that ye may become the sons of God, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, that we may have this hope, that we may be purified even as he is pure. End of quote. President Howard W. Hunter taught that righteousness should be at the heart of all service we give. Quote, continue to seek opportunities for service. Don't be overly concerned with status. It is important to be appreciated, but our focus should be on righteousness, not recognition, on service, not status. The faithful visiting teacher who quietly goes about her work month after month is just as important to the work of the Lord as those who occupy what some see as more prominent positions in the church. Visibility does not equate to value. End of quote. Elder Robert J. Wetton of the Quorum of Seventy explained how the service we render to others can be used to measure the depth of our personal conversion. Quote, conversion means consecrating your life to caring for and serving others who need your help and sharing your gifts and blessings. Every unselfish act of kindness and service increases your spirituality. God would use you to bless others. Your continued spiritual growth and eternal progression are very much wrapped up in your relationships and how you treat others. Do you indeed love others and become a blessing in their lives? Isn't the measure of the level of your conversion how you treat others? The person who does not the person who does only those things in the church that concern himself alone will never reach the goal of perfection. Service to others is what the gospel and exalted life are all about. End of quote. Elder Downlay Chokes of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles helps us understand that in addition to what service we do, it is very important why we do it. Quote, the last motive is, in my opinion, the highest reason of all. It is in its relationship to service, it is what the scriptures call a more excellent way. If our service is to be most efficacious, it must be accomplished for the love of God and the love of his children. Brothers and sisters, I must not also live the gospel, but my motives for living them must be pure. What are my motives? Chapter 2, verse 18, the manner in which King Benjamin honored his kingship with selfless and righteous service made him a perfect type for the Messiah, who is Israel's king. Chapter 2, verse 19, the phrase heavenly king meant the government of heaven is that of a kingdom. God and his son are our kings. We long for the day when Christ will reign as king of Zion. All who obtain the fullness of the Father, will in like manner be ordained priests and kings. See, one day this church will also be the government. When Christ comes, his kingdom will reign. His kingdom is not just religious, but it's also political. And so Christ will reign spiritually and politically over us. Oh, how I long for that day when we can get rid of the corrupt political kingdom and governments of the world which we have today. 
chapter 2, verses 21 through 24 and verse 34, the phrase unprofitable servants indebted unto him meant Elder Joseph B. Worland, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, taught that we should spend all our days in pursuit of eternal life as a means of showing gratitude for the debt of Jesus Christ for the debt Jesus Christ paid on our behalf. Quote, he said, how can we ever repay the debt we owe the Savior? He paid a debt he does not owe to free us from the debt we can never pay. Because of him, we will live forever. Because of his infinite atonement, our sins can be swept away, allowing us to experience the greatest of all of God's gift, eternal life. Can such a gift have a price? Can we ever make compensation for such a gift? The Book of Mormon prophet King Benjamin taught that if you should render all the thanks and praise which your whole soul has power to possess and serve him with all your whole souls, yet ye would be unprofitable servants. End of quote. Brothers and sisters, we will always be indebted to Jesus Christ and our Father in heaven for eternity and throughout all eternities. One of the best ways for us, each of us, to demonstrate gratitude for the Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ gives us is to keep the commandments. President Joseph Fielding Smith taught, We are extremely ungrateful to our Father and to His beloved Son when, when in all humility, with broken hearts and contrite spirits, we are unwilling to keep the commandments. The violation of any divine commandment is, most un, is, the, is a most ungrateful act considering all that has been accomplished for us through the atonement of the Savior. We will never be able to pay the debt. The gratitude of our hearts should be filled to, over, to overflowing in love and obedience for his great and tender mercy. For what he has done, we should never fail him. He bought us with a price, the price of his great suffering and the spilling of his blood in the sacrifice on the cross. Brothers and sisters, we have been bought with the blood of Christ, his royal blood of heaven. Why would we ever want to disappoint him and disobey him? Now he asks us to keep his commandments. He says they are not grievous and they are not some and there are not so many of us who are not willing to do it. I am speaking now generally of the people of the earth. We are not willing to do it. That certainly is ingratitude. We are ungrateful. Every member of this church who violates the Sabbath day, who is not honest in paying his tithings, who will not keep the word of wisdom, who willfully violates any of the other commandments the Lord has given us, is ungrateful to the Son of God. And one ungrateful to the Son of God is ungrateful to the Father who sent him. End of President Smith's quote. Chapter 2, verse 22, the phrase... He never doth vary from that which he has said, means those principles by which the salvation comes are ever the same. All who will have a blessing at my hand, the Lord said, shall abide the law which is appointed for that blessing and the conditions thereof as were instituted from before the foundation of the world. Paul referred to the gospel message as hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Chapter 2, verse 25. The phrase, your body belongeth to him who created you. Mosiah 2, 25 is the Lord's response to those who claim that it's my body and I can do what I want with it. King Benjamin point that, that our bodies belong to God is consistent with the teachings of Paul when he wrote, For you are bought with the price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. They are not your bodies. Yes, you can do what you want with them, but you must then suffer the consequences of those choices because God owns you and you must give an account of what you did with the body that belongs to him. Chapter 2, verse 27 through 28, the phrase that your blood should not come upon me meant as God's messenger, King Benjamin had no prerogative other than to deliver the message he has received. The principle applies alike to all to whom the message is given. It becometh every man who hath been willing to warn his neighbor. Therefore they are left without excuse, and their sins are upon their own heads. 
Should the messenger fail to deliver the message, he then assumes a responsibility for the sins of those who went unwarned because he was derelict in his duty. I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but I have enough of my own challenges that I want to answer for. I don't want to answer for others. So may we not be derelict in our duty in warning the world the best we can. Chapter 2, verse 29 through 32. In announcing Mosiah as his successor, King Benjamin reminded his people that they had been blessed because they had kept the commandments he and his father had given them. He assured them that those blessings would continue at the hands of Mosiah. It is a religious duty to saints in all ages to sustain righteous governments. Without a society of law and order, there can be no freedom of worship. Chapter 2, verse 30 to the phrase, Beware, lest there should arise contention, meaning, As peace is a distinguished characteristic of the Spirit of the Lord, so the spirit of contention represents the master of strife, who is Satan. Chapter 2, verse 33, There is no neutrality where principles of salvation are at issue. Obedience to principles of truth until more than mere submission. Exaltation, the fullness of the Father, is for those who have valiantly championed those principles. Conversely, to list to obey the spirit of the evil one is to actively and knowingly rebel against that which is just and true. Chapter 2, verse 34, the phrase, Render to him all that you have, meant the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. That spirit which acknowledges the sovereignty of God elicits within the heart of the wise steward a desire to consecrate his all for good and righteous purposes. Chapter 2, verse 35, the phrase, they are just and true, meant perhaps the nearest phrase in thought content to just and true is righteousness and trustworthy. The idea being conveyed is that all that comes from God is right and proper, and that through obedience we have the sure promise of his blessings. Chapter 2, verse 36 through 37, the phrase, Withdraw yourselves from the Spirit of the Lord, open rebellion against God, meant we typically speak of the Spirit withdrawing from the evildoer. In this text, however, Benjamin suggests that it is the evildoer who withdraws from the spirit. The unclean spirit by nature seeks the society of other spirits like itself. When someone has committed himself to the kingdom of God and then falls prey to an evil spirit, it is no longer possible for him to remain neutral. He becomes an enemy to the church and to, un and to all righteousness and wars against its doctrines. He may leave the church, but he cannot leave it alone. Such is the spirit of the adversary. Once a bright and shining star who rebelled against God and his only begotten son, Satan came out and opened warfare against God and all those whom the Father had chosen to be his rulers. He brought accusations against them before our God day and night. President Gordon B. Hinckley shared the following simple illustration of such rebellion. Quote, I recall a bishop telling me of a woman who came to get a recommend. When asked if she observed the word of wisdom, she said that she occasionally drank a cup of coffee. She said, now, bishop, you're not going to let that keep me from going to the temple, are you? To which she replied, sister, surely you will not let a cup of coffee stand between you and the house of the Lord. End of quote. Great follow-up to that sister's flippant reply. Chapter 2, verse 38, the phrase, shank, shrink from the presence of the Lord. King Benjamin described with vividness the awfulness of hell after death, the place where the wicked suffer pain, guilt, pain, and anguish. Righteousness causes our confidence to wax strong in the presence of God, while the wicked pray that they might become extinct, both body and soul, rather than stand in that presence to be judged of their deeds. The unclean spirit naturally shrinks from the presence of that which is clean. Do you not suppose that ye shall dwell with God under consciousness of your guilt, Moroni asked? 
do you suppose that you could be happy to dwell with that whole being, holy being, when your souls are racked with a consciousness of guilt that ye have ever abused his laws? Behold, I say unto you, you would be more miserable to dwell with the holy and just God under a consciousness of your filthiness before him than you would to dwell with the damned souls in hell. Chapter 2, verse 38, the phrase, demands of justice, man. The demands of justice is best described by Alma in Alma 42, 17 through 25, which say, Now he could, and now, how could a man repent except he should, be sin, except he should sin? How could he sin if there was no law? How could there be a law say there was a punishment? Now there was a punishment affixed and a just law given which brought remorse of consciousness unto man. Now if there was no law given, if a man murdered, he should die. Would he be afraid he would die if he should murder? And also if there was no law given against sin, men would not be afraid to sin. And if there was no law given, if men sinned, what could justice do or mercy either? For they would have no claim upon the creature. But there is a law given, and a punishment affixed, and a repentance granted, which repentance mercy claimeth. Otherwise, justice claimeth the creature, and executeth the law, and the law inflicteth the punishment. Just to break from this quote of Alma, there is no such thing as unconditional mercy. Mercy is based upon the law of repentance. Back to Alma. If not so, the works of justice would be destroyed, and God would cease to be God. But God ceaseth not to be God, and mercy claimeth the penitent. And mercy cometh because of the atonement, and the atonement bringeth to pass the resurrection of the dead. And the resurrection of the dead bringeth back unto men into the presence of God. And thus they are restored unto his presence, to be judged according to their works, according to the law and justice. For behold, justice exerciseth all its demands, and also mercy claimeth all which is her own, and thus none but the truly penitent are saved. What do you suppose, that mercy can rob justice? I say unto you, yea, nay, not one would, if so God would cease to be God. So do not get up in the false teachings, even found within this church, that God loves me, and so he, since he loves me so much, his mercy will save me in the last day, regardless of what I have done. No, the only way you get mercy is to be repentant. Chapter 2, verse 38, the phrase, which is like an unquenchable fire, meant the fires of hell are but a metaphor for the feelings of anguish to be suffered by the wicked in the spirit world as they wait the day of judgment. The torment of disappointment in the mind of man, said Joseph Smith, is as exquisite as a lake burning with fire and brimstone. So that's what those who decide to live after the manner of the world and attain a telestial kingdom will have to suffer. The gate into the telestial kingdom is hell. You must suffer in hell. Then get cleaned up to at least go to a telestial kingdom. Chapter 2, verse 39, the phrase, to endure a never-ending torment. What does that phrase mean? Does that mean the torment is forever? No. Doctrine and Covenants 19, 10 through 12 says, For behold, the mystery of godliness, how great it is. For behold, I am endless, and the punishment which is given from my hand is endless punishment. For endless is my name. Wherefore, eternal punishment is God's punishment. Endless punishment is God's punishment. Thus, never-ending torment is godly torment, since God is never-ending. Therefore, Jacob explained in Jacob 9.16, They who are filthy shall be filthy still. The resurrection does not change one's disposition, nor does it alter one's spiritual directions. One who was honorable, moral honors, but not valiant in the testimony of Jesus, shall rise to a terrestrial glory. One who lived a telestial existence on earth, who lived after the ways of the world, shall reap as he sowed. Moroni taught that 
Because of the redemption of man, which came by Jesus Christ, men are brought back into the presence of the Lord. Yea, this is wherein all men are redeemed, because the death of Christ bringeth to pass the resurrection. And then cometh the judgment of the Holy One upon them. And then cometh the time that he that is filthy shall be filthy still, and he that is righteous shall be righteous still. He that is happy shall be happy still, and he that is unhappy shall be unhappy still. So when it says a never-ending torment that people face in hell, that means being a godly torment. They must suffer like God. But when they're resurrected, that torment will end, except for sons of perdition. They will have a never-ending torment with Satan and his host for eternity. But all others will be redeemed in either a telestial, terrestrial, or celestial redemption. Jacob explained that those who are filthy are the devil and his angels. Those who have followed him from time to time, from the time of the war in heaven and the pre-existence, as well as those in this life who deny the Lord and defy his works, the sons of perdition. That which breaketh the law, the Lord explains in the revelation known as the olive leaf, and abideth not my law, but seek to become a law unto itself, and willeth to abide in sin, and altogether abide in sin, cannot be sanctified by law, neither by mercy, justice, nor judgment. This is in reference to sons of perdition. Therefore, they must remain filthy still. In that same revelation, the Lord speaks of the angels surrounding the different trumps associated with the specific resurrection, celestial, terrestrial, and telestial. After discussing the last group, the telestial, those who do not come forth from the grave until the thousand years are ended, the Lord continues. And another trump shall sound, which is the fourth trump, saying, There are found among those who are to remain, the sons of perdition, until that great and last day, even the end, who shall remain filthy still. So it's the sons of perdition who will remain filthy forever. There is no redemption. All others going to a telestial, terrestrial, celestial state will be redeemed to, and then go to the kingdom that they're Redemption qualifies them for, according to the works they have done on earth. Chapter 2, verse 41, the phrase, Blessed and happy state of those who keep the commandments, both temporal and spiritual, meant, To those who keep his commandments, the Lord has promised in D&C 59, 16-21, The fullness of the earth is yours, the beast of the field and the foulness of, and the fowls of the air, and that which climbeth upon the trees and walketh upon the earth, yea, and the herb and good things which come of the earth, whether for food or for remnant, or for houses or for barns, or for orchards or for gardens, or for vineyards, yea, all things which come of the earth in the season thereof are made for the benefit and the use of man, both to please the eye and to gladden the heart, for food and for raiment, for taste, for smell, to strengthen the body and to enliven the soul. And it pleaseth God that he hath given all these things unto man. For unto this end were they made to be used with judgment, not to excess, neither by extortion. And in nothing doth man offend God, or against none is his wrath kindled, save those who confess not his hand in all things, and obey not his commandments. So God has given us this wonderful blessing on earth, but we must be wise stewards and not to go in excess. Let's turn to now Mosiah chapter 3. Chapter 3, verses 2 through 3, the phrase, an angel from God with glad tidings of great joy, refers to, angels have played an important part in the teaching the gospel to the children of men since the days of Adam, because Satan and his legions seek to counterfeit these visits even appearing as an angel of light, the scripture frequently identifies righteous angels by such titles as an angel of the Lord, his holy angel, angel of his presence, and angel of God. These angels are messengers of God and as such frequently come to instruct and prophesy relative to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The message of the gospel is attained by a spirit of rejoicing among all who receive it. These glad tidings of great joy center among the ancient in the prophecy of the birth of Christ and his mortal ministry. Chapter 3, verse 4, the phrase, The Lord hath heard thy prayers and hath judged of the righteousness, meant from the 
and from the instruction given by the angel to King Benjamin, it would appear that he had sought understanding relative to the coming and ministry of Jesus Christ, the hope of Israel. How often the Lord's people been edified and instructed through the prayerful searchings for understanding by a noble prophet. Righteousness is the key that unlocks the powers of heaven, as DNC 121, 36 through 37 explains that the righteous of the priesthood that the rights of the priesthood are inseparably connected with the powers of heaven. And the powers of heaven cannot be controlled nor handled only upon the principles of righteousness. That they may be conferred upon us, it is true. But when we undertake to cover our sins or to gratify our pride or our vain ambitions or to exercise control or dominion or compulsion upon the souls of the children of men in any degree of unrighteousness, behold, the heavens withdraw themselves, the Spirit of the Lord is grieved, and when it is withdrawn, amen to the priesthood authority or the authority of that man. Now please understand, sisters, this also applies to you, not just to priesthood holders. If you want righteous power in your life as a mother to bless your children, then it is in the powers of heaven are inseparably connected and controlled on the principles of righteousness. If you as a mother seek to gratify your pride, cover your sins, have vain ambitions, and to exercise control and dominion or compulsion upon anyone, then amen to any power that you are blessed with. You will also use your power. So this applies to both men and women. The principle applies alike to those in and out of the church. When the angel of God appeared to Cornelius, a devout man who earnestly sought the truth, he said, Thy prayers and thy alms are come up for a memorial unto God. That is, your good works have unlocked the heavens to you. Conversely, those who are deceived by angels of the prince of darkness have made themselves susceptible to that deception by the works of darkness. The phrase filled with joy means peace and joy are the words most commonly used in the scripture to describe that spirit that attends the gospel and willing obedience to its precepts. Chapter 3, verse 5, the phrase, what does the term Lord omnipotent mean? Of all the prophets recorded in the Book of Mormon, King Benjamin is the only one to use the term omnipotent, which under Bruce R. McConkie, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, defined this way, Christ is the Lord omnipotent, meaning that as Lord of all, he has all power, end of quote. In the lectures on faith, Joseph Smith said, quote, unless God had all power over all things and was able by his power to control all things and thereby deliver his creatures who put their trust in him from the power of all being that might seek their destruction whether in heaven or on earth in hell men could not be saved end of quote therefore god has all power along with all knowledge how could he save us unless he knew all things chapter 3 verse 5 the phrase from all eternity to all eternity the following scriptures increases our knowledge of this phrase. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thereby showing us that he is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Listen to the voice of the Lord your God, even Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, whose course is one eternal round, the same yesterday, today, as yesterday, and forever. Thus saith the Lord your God, even Jesus Christ, the great I Am, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the same which looketh upon the wide expanse of eternity, and all the sephiric host of heaven before the world was made, the same which knoweth all things, for all things are present before mine eyes. I am the same which spake, and the world was made, and all things came by me. From eternity to all eternity he is the same, and his years never faileth. So that's what it means when he is from all eternity to all eternity. A million years from now, when Christ creates other earths, or we do, it will be the same gospel that Jesus Christ preached that will save the inhabitants of those earths, because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. As we view things from our mortal perspective, it is natural to speak of things that are part of eternity past and of other things that will take place in eternity of the future. 
In those past ages when all men dwelt in the presence of the Eternal Father were one eternity. In those future ages in which we hope to obtain an exaltation and to give birth to spiritual children of our own and begin again the cycle of creation, redemption, and salvation constitute eternal future. Thus it will be yet Thus it will yet be said of those who obtain that exalted status, as it is of God and Christ, that they are from eternity to eternity, at the, or that they are from everlasting to everlasting. Chapter 3, verse 6, cast out devils. Right? It is common to the ideologies of men to rationalize either spirits under the rubric of insanity or mental disorder. The Book of Mormon forms the reality of evil spirits and the power of the Lord and his authorized servants to exorcise demons. The present text clarifies that our Lord literally cast out evil spirits from the souls of persons afflicted with them. Chapter 3, verse 7. The phrase, he shall suffer temptations, pain of body, even more than man can suffer, referred to. Christ's agony in the garden is unfathomable. By the finite man, wrote Elder James E. Talmage of the Quorum of the Twelve, quote, both as to intensity and cause, he struggled and groaned under a burden such as no other being who has lived on earth might even conceive as possible. It was not physical pain or mental anguish alone that caused him to suffer such torture as to produce an extrusion of blood from every pore, but a spiritual agony of soul such as only God was capable of experiencing. No other man, however great his powers of physical or mental endurance, could have suffered so, for his human organism would have succumbed, and succumbed would have produced unconsciousness and welcome oblivion. In other words, it would have killed a mortal man. Illinois A. Maxwell, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, referred to the experience the suffering experienced by Jesus Christ as the awful arithmetic of the atonement. Quote, imagine Jehovah, the creator of this and other worlds, astonished. Jesus knew cognitively what he must do, but not experientially. He has never personally known the exquisite and exacting process of an atonement before. Thus, when the agony came in its fullness, it was so much more worse than he that even he with his unique intellect had ever imagined. No wonder an angel appeared to strengthen him. The cumulative weight of all mortal sins, past, present, and future, pressed upon that perfect sinless and sensitive soul. All our infirmities and sicknesses were somehow, too, a part of the awful arithmetic of the atonement. The anguished Jesus not only pled with the Father that the hour and cup might pass from him, but with this relevant citation, he, and he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Had not Jesus, as Jehovah, said to Abraham, Is anything too hard for the Lord? Had not his angel told a perplexed Mary, For without God nothing shall be impossible? Jesus' request was not theater. In his extremity, did he perchance hope for a recurring ram in the thicket, a rescuing ram in the thicket? I do not know. His suffering, as it were, enormity multiplied by infin infinity, evoked his later soul cry on the cross as it looked was a cry of forsakenness. Even so, Jesus maintained this sublime submissiveness as he it had in, the, in Gethsemane, Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. End of quote. Brothers and sisters, as we go through our own Gethsemanes, we must also learn to be able to say, Nevertheless, Father, not what I want, but what you want in our infirmities and sufferings. Chapter 3, verse 7, the phrase, Blood cometh of every poor. Of the Gospel writers, only Luke confirms this part of the angels' messianic prophecy describing christ agony in gethsemane luke said that the savior sweat as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground those referring those refusing to repent must ultimately suffer even as i the lord told joseph smith which suffering caused myself even god the greatest of all to tremble because of pain and to bleed at every pore and to suffer both body and spirit 
and would that I might not drink the bitter cup and shrink. Brothers and sisters, may we be wise enough to use the Savior's suffering instead of having to repeat it on our own. One commentator wrote that the Savior's suffering was the total weight of the consequence of the fall. Quote, Jesus knew that the awful hour of his deepest humiliation had arrived, that from this moment till the uttering of that great cry with which he expired, which he expired, nothing remained for him on earth but the torture of physical pain and the poignancy of mental anguish. All that the human frame can tolerate of suffering was to be heaped upon him, upon his shrinking body. Every miserable misery that cruel and crushing insult can afflict was to weigh heavily upon his soul. And in this torture of body and agony of soul, even the high and radiant serenity of his divine spirit was to suffer a short but terrible eclipse. Pain in its cutest sting, shame in its most overwhelming brutality, all of the burden of the sin and mystery of man's experience in its apostasy and fall, that was what he must now face in all of its most inexplicable accumulation. End of quote by F.W. Farrar. Chapter 3, verse 8, Names and Titles of Christ. Both God and Christ are referred to throughout the scriptures by hundreds of names. Each of these titles has its purpose to teach something singular about them. Jesus, the Hebrew for Joshua, is a given name that means Jehovah saves. Christ is a title meaning anointed or anointed one. Son of God denominates the reality of Jesus' divine nature. He is in reality God's Son. Father of heaven and earth denotes Christ's role in the creation. The, the title creator of all things explains his creative role to embrace all that lives, dies, and is resurrected in and through his atoning sacrifice. The phrase, his mother shall be called Mary. Here in Alma 7.10, the name of Christ's mother is given in the form of a messianic prophecy. Mary is the Greek form for her name, which in Hebrew would have been Miriam. Many etymologies are suggested for the name. The most appropriate are exalted of the Lord and bitter tears. The prophetic giving of names, which would then become descriptive of the role to be played by the one so named, is common to many of the characters in both the Old and New Testament. Chapter 3, verse 9, the phrase, He cometh unto his own, that salvation might come means Moses had told the children of Israel that the Messiah would come from the midst of thee, and that he would be of thy brethren. The Messiah could come from none but the chosen lineage. The popularized notion that salvation means one thing and the exaltation another is without scriptural support in the Book of Mormon. Here, as in virtually every scriptural text, salvation is son a synonym for exaltation. Chapter 3, verse 9, the phrase that he that hath the devil and shall scourge him and crucify him. It refers to how hard the hearts and blind the eyes of those given up to wickedness that God himself should be called a devil and scourged and crucified by Israel's leaders. Thus those who know only darkness seek to be seen as angels of light and labor to clothe all that light in the dark robes they wear. Chapter 3, verse 10, the phrase, rise the third day, and a righteous judgment referred to. Writing to the Corinthians, Paul said, he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Paul is quoting a text that is nowhere found in the Old Testament of our day. Significantly, the Book of Mormon attributes this knowledge to Zenos, an Old Testament prophet. This understanding was common among the Nephite people. Through his atoning sacrifice, Christ mended a broken law, answering the ends of the fall. He brought us, he bought us all at the price of his own suffering, as the perfect and sinless offering by which salvation is made possible to all. Christ merited the right to stand as judge of all. His will be, his will, his will be a righteous judgment, granting to every man according to their works. Chapter, 11, chapter 3, verse 11, the phrase, Who have died not knowing the will of God. There is but one gospel law, and it is by that law all men must be judged. 
Our God is just and merciful. When we are given a law, whenever opportunities for obedience are made available, the Almighty expects us to be true to those divine directives. When, however, adequate opportunities for understanding are not available to us through circumstances beyond our control, God will hold us guiltless in regard to that law until a time when compliance is possible. The law of justification thus demands that all who are saved in the celestial kingdom must have conformed to the laws requisite for entrance into that kingdom. None will so attain under false pretense. For all who will have a blessing at my hands shall abide the law which is appointed for that blessing and the conditions thereof, as were instructed from before the foundations of the world. The law of justification all assures that no person in all eternity will be punished for disobedience to a law which he or she was ignorant. No child of God will be eternally disadvantaged for non-compliance with a principle or for non-observance of an ordinance of which he or she had no knowledge. In short, there is not a soul who will be deprived of the opportunity for all the blessings of exaltation because the fullness of the gospel law was not had during this mortal sojourn. That's why for God to be just, there must be the preaching of the gospel in the spirit world for those who never had the opportunity to hear the laws of God in mortality. Joseph Smith learned by Revelation, for example, that all who have died without a knowledge of this gospel, who would have received it if they had been permitted to tarry, shall be heirs of the celestial kingdom of God. Also, all that shall die henceforth without a knowledge of it, who would have received it with all their hearts, shall be heirs of that kingdom, because they will accept it in the spirit world. And then the Lord explained the basis of this principle, the foundation stone upon which the law of justice rests, the very essence of the reason why the Latter-day Saints, I'm sorry, I don't know where that, that, that typo comes from. It should be Latter-day Latter-day Saints devote themselves unceasingly to the labor in behalf of their dead. For I, the Lord, will judge all men according to their works, according to the desires of their hearts. In Alma's words, it is requisite with the justice of God that men should be judged according to their works. And if their works were good in this life, and the desire of their hearts were good, that they should also at the last day be restored unto that which is good. Chapter 3, verse 13. God has sent his holy prophets among all the children of men, and rejoice with exceedingly great joy, referred to, if one nation and people are entitled to an apostolic witness of the verities of salvation, so are all nations and peoples. An apostle, literally one who is sent, speaks with divine authorization. He is a personal representative of the one sending him. Christ, the apostle and high priest of our profession, speaking of the Father, said, I know him, for I am from him, and he has sent me. And so saying, Jesus conformed with the prophetic pattern, professing to have been sent with the message of the Father. Thus it was that such mighty prophets as Moses, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, having been sent of Jehovah, are properly spoken of as apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. From the days of Moses, it has been declared that they who will not hear the voice of the Lord, neither the voice of his servants, neither give heed to the words of the prophets and apostles sent ones, shall be cut off from among the people of the covenant. The gospel is called the glad tidings of great joy. It carries a spirit that lightens the heart and brings joy to the soul. The scriptures constantly describe those returning to Zion, those coming to worship their God, as doing so in the spirit of rejoicing and song. The ransom of the Lord shall return, Isaiah said, and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Our modern revelation says that those embracing the gospel in the last days, that they shall be filled with songs of everlasting joy. The three words most common scripture descriptions as those embracing the gospel are joy, gladness, and rejoicing. Chapter 3, verse 13, as though he had already come, ain't. for the faithful, those who accepted the messianic message, for such persons it was as though the act of the atonement were moments of the past, 
as if it had already come to pass. So those faithful who lived prior to Christ's atonement could rely upon the atonement as if it had already happened. Chapter 3, verse 14, a stiff-necked people meant the Lord can give only that which people are willing to receive. The law of Moses was a lesser law given to a people who refused anything more. Similarly, in our day, those who profess to accept the Bible are rejecting the words of living prophets have but a fragment of the understanding that would be theirs, were they not also a stiff-necked people. Chapter 3, verse 15, the phrase many signs and wonders meant, as we have been promised that signs and wonders will precede the second coming, so there were signs and wonders that announced the birth, death, and resurrection of Christ, in compliance with the verity that Christ is the great creator of all things. It is wholly appropriate that all that he has created, both in heaven and in earth, join in testifying of his divinity. Let the mountains shout for joy, and yea, and all the valleys cry aloud, Yea, and all the seas and dry lands tell the wonders of your eternal king, and your rivers and your brooks and your rills flow down with gladness. Let the woods and all the trees of the field praise the Lord, and ye solid rocks weep for joy. And let the sun, moon, and morning stars sing together, and let all the sons of God shout for joy. And let the eternal creations declare his name forever. The phrase types and shadows means as used in scriptures, types, which include persons, objects, or events, symbolize future or even greater symbolize future events of, of greater magnitude. The prophetic nature of the type is the shadow that is cast. Virtually everything in the law of Moses was, according to divine design, given to teach and testify of Christ and his atoning sacrifice. Yet, like those of our day, who have so immersed themselves in the Bible that they have lost sight of its intent and purpose, those of ancient day became so enamored by the intricacies of the law that they lost the sight of the lawgiver. The law of Moses was a grand lesson given by Jehovah himself in which he foretold the events of his mortal ministry with symbols, similitudes, and substitutes. They missed the symbolism of the law of Moses. And we too can miss the symbolism of the gospel if we don't focus it on Christ. The phrase, the law of Moses availeth nothing, meant as modern Jews have removed the sacrificial lamb from the Passover Seder, so their fathers of ancient Israel fiduciously observed the rituals of the Mosaic law, blind to the central role of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Without the atonement of Christ, the law of Moses meant nothing. It pointed to nothing. The law of Moses could not save anyone. It was to point their souls to Christ. And those who used it that way and have faith in Christ, then they were saved and gained the greater ordinances of the Melchizedek priesthood. Chapter 3, verse 16. Even if it were possible that little children could sin, they could not be saved, refers to. King Benjamin, Benjamin could give no more perfect illustration of the dependence of all men upon the atoning sacrifice of Christ than that of sinless children. Even the child, without the slightest taint of sin or transgression, is subject to the effects of the fall and has no hope of salvation independent of the atoning sacrifice of Christ. Little children are saved, not because they're little children, but because of the atonement of Christ. Covers them because they're not accountable. They still have to be covered under the atonement. To be free from sin is a requisite of salvation, but it is insufficient for salvation. Salvation is in Christ and Him alone. It is the atonement of Christ that makes possible the salvation of sinless children. Chapter 3, verses 17 through 18, the phrase, salvation centers in Christ, meant, if he had not ransomed men from the effects of the fall, there would be no resurrection, no judgment, no celestial kingdom, no salvation of any kind. Had it not been for his atoning sacrifice, all mankind would have been lost forever, both temporally and spiritually. Even the most virtuous of persons would know nothing save an eternal damnation. The phrase, the infant perisheth not, meant, 
and I also beheld that all children who die before they arrive at the years of accountability are saved in the celestial kingdom of heaven. Again, not because they're sinless little children, but because of the atonement of Christ covers them because they are still born and fallen in a fallen world. Chapter 3, verse 19. The natural man is an enemy to God. King Benjamin is not teaching that men are de depraved. We are the offspring of God and inherit both body and spirit from him. We sustain the doctrine of the psalmist who wrote, Ye are gods and all ye are children of the Most High. Ours is a divine nature, yet ours is a world of sin, a world in which sin conceiveth in our hearts, a world in which all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Such is the state of the natural man, one in which he is unworthy of the divine presence. To the extent that we resist the enticing of the Spirit, we are at odds with God and in a state of rebellion against that which is divine within us. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. When men or women love Satan more than God, when they give themselves up to sinful practices, they are carnal, sensual, and devilish by nature. Therefore, they are enemies to God. Chapter 3, verse 19, the phrase, putteth off the natural man, means the natural man is an enemy to God. The sanctified man is not. Through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may, by obedience to laws and ordinances of the gospel, sanctify themselves, cease to be God's enemy, and become one with him. Such must yield to the enticings of the Holy Spirit. The Book of Mormon seeks to invite all men to pursue such a course. Come unto Christ, Moroni pleaded as he completed his record, and be perfected in him, and deny yourselves of all ungodliness. And if ye shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness, and love God with all your might, mind, and strength, then is his grace sufficient for you, that by his grace ye may be perfect in Christ. And if by the grace of God ye are perfect in Christ, ye can in no wise deny the power of God. And again, if ye by the grace of God are perfect in Christ, and deny not the power, then are ye sanctified in Christ by his grace of God through the shedding of the blood of Christ. So that is how we get rid of this natural man that we all inherit when we are born. We become fallen man. Eleanor Neal A. Maxwell discuss how we might accomplish this task. Quote, Personal righteousness, worship, prayer, and scripture study are so crucial in order to put off the natural man. In an early address, Elder Maxwell suggested another tool along with a caution for putting off the natural man. Quote, Hope is particularly needed in the hand-to-hand -hand combat required to put off the natural man. Giving up on God and on oneself constitutes simultaneous surrender to the natural man. End of quote. Chapter 3, verse 19, the phrase becometh a saint means the word saint is tied to the Hebrew word kadosh, which means to separate, to be apart from, and to become sanctified and holy for a specific purpose. In all dispensations of time, the Lord's people have been called saints, thus emphasizing that they are people who have separated themselves from that which is worldly, and they are seeking through obedience to laws and ordinances of the gospel to become a holy people. They have consecrated themselves. They have, through covenant agreement, chosen to do all that they do with sacredness. The angel's choice of words become a saint, stresses that sanctification, becoming a saint, is indeed the labor of a lifetime, a process rather than a singular spiritual experience or event. So we, to become sanctified is to be separated from the natural manness of the world for a specific purpose. And what is the specific purpose? We are to become sanctified so that we can become exalted. That is our purpose to become exalted. While discussing what it means to be a saint, Elder Quentin L. Cook of the Quorum of the Twelve cited that definition and then provide examples of things we must separate ourselves from. Quote, the world saint in Greek denotes set apart, separate, and holy. 
If we are to be saints in our day, we need to separate ourselves from evil conduct and destructive pursuits that are prevalent in the world. We are bombarded with visual images of violence and immorality. Inappropriate music and pornography are increasingly tolerated. The use of drugs and alcohol is rampant. There is less emphasis on honesty and character. Individual rights are demanded, but duties, responsibilities, and obligations are neglected. There has been a coarsening of dialogue and increasing exposure to that which is base and vulgar. The adversary has been relentless in his efforts to undermine the plan of happiness. If we separate ourselves from this worldly conduct, we will have the spirit in our lives and experience the joy of being worthy Latter-day Saints. End of quote. Chapter 3, verse 19, the phrase, Becometh as a child, refers to, Except you be converted and become as a little children, the Savior said to those of the old world, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. To the righteous remnant of Israel among the Book of Mormon peoples, that same Lord declared, Whoso repenteth and cometh unto me as a little child, him will I receive, for of such is the kingdom of God. Behold, for such I have laid down my life, and taken it up again. The present text suggests what was intended in the divine directive that we become as little children, namely that we be submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth and fit to inflict upon us, even as a child does submit to his father, and become innocent without guilt. That's what little children are, and they're covered by the atonement. They are innocent without guilt. And so when he says become like a little child, we need to use repentance to once again become innocent without guilt from our sins. See, then we're like little children. It is a complete trust in God that this expression describes a total acknowledgement of the wisdom of the omniscient one. It is an absolute acknowledgement that salvation is to be had only on the Lord's terms. Our unconditional surrender to the mind and will of God restores to us that simplicity and faith and unwavering confidence otherwise known only little children. President Henry B. Irene, the first president, taught how becoming as a child leads to spiritual safety. He said, quote, King Benjamin makes it clear how we can have our natures changed through the atonement of Jesus Christ. That is the only way we can build on the sure foundation and stand firm in righteousness during the storms of temptation. King Dejan described that change with a beautiful comparison used by prophets for millennia and by the Lord himself. It is this, that we can and must become as a child, a little child. For some, that will not be easy to understand or to accept. Most of us want to be strong. We may, we may well see being like, a little, being like a child as being weak. But King Benjamin, who understood as well as any mortal what it meant to, to be a man of strength and courage, makes it clear that to be like a child is not to be childish. It is to be like the Savior who prayed to the Father for strength to be able to do his will, and then he did it. Our natures must be changed to become as a child to gain the strength we must have to be safe in the times of mortal peril. We are safe on the rock which is the Savior when we have yielded in faith, have yielded in faith in Him, have responded to the Holy Spirit, direct to keep the commandments long enough and faithful enough for the power of the atonement has changed our hearts. When we have by that experience become as a child in our capacity to love and obey, we are on a sure foundation. From King Benjamin, we learn that we can, what we can do to take us to that safe place. But remember, the things we do are the means, not the end we seek. What we do allows the atonement of Jesus Christ to change us into what we must be. Our faith in Jesus Christ brings us to repentance and to keeping his commandments. We obey and we resist temptation by following the promptings of the Holy Ghost. In time, our natures will change. We will become as a little child, obedient to God and more loving. That change, if we do, if we do all we must do to keep it, will qualify us to enjoy the gifts which come to the Holy Ghost. Then we will be safe 
and on the only sure rock. End of quote. Chapter 3, verse 20. It is the destiny of the Book of Mormon to be the instrument by which this prophecy that the knowledge of Christ would go forth to those of every nation, kindred, and tongue of people is to be fulfilled. As John the Baptist went before Christ as an Elias to prepare the way before him, so the Bible would precede the Book of Mormon among many peoples to prepare them for the more perfect witness that was to come. But as the ministry of John was not enough to assure salvation, neither is the ministry of the Bible sufficient. Verily thus saith the Lord, that the things might be known among you, O inhabitants of the earth, I have sent forth mine angel Moroni, flying through the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, who hath appeared unto some, and hath committed it unto man, who shall appear unto many that dwell on the earth. And this gospel, the gospel restored to the Book of Mormon, shall be preached unto every nation, kindred, tongues, and people. In the full sense and complete sense, the fulfillment of this promise is millennial, a time when the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know ye the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them, unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. Won't that be marvelous towards the end of the millennium? Will all will now be members of the church and know the Lord? Chapter 3, verses 21 through 22. It is incumbent upon all who enjoy mortal citizenship to seek after the truths of salvation. Having obtained those truths, men and women are responsible to embrace and live them. To do otherwise is to be in a state of rebellion to be a captive to the natural man, and thus to become an enemy to God and righteousness. Chapter 3, verses 25 to 27, Justice cannot be denied. Those who have sown the seeds of righteousness will harvest as they have sown. Those who have reveled in sowing the seeds, evil seeds and remained unrepentant must endlessly feast on the bitter fruits of their own planting. Chapter 3, verse 25, endless torment, as we've already discussed. Endless, as used in such context, context and in such text, refers to the quality or nature of the punishment rather than to its duration, as we read CDNC 19.6, 10 through 12. Endless torment just means godly torment because endless is one of his names. Chapter 3, verse 27, as if. The fact that the phrase, like a fire of brimstone, was never intended to be more than metaphorical is attested here by the words, is, is as. So, the suffering is as like a fire of brimstone was metaphorical. That's what the torment will be like for those in hell. Thank you for watching. Hopefully this helped you with these chapters and some of the great teachings of King Benjamin in his preaching from the temple. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button.